Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody, and shalom. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Robert Like, and I'm chair of the Stahl Memorial Lecture Series in Bioethics, and it's a pleasure to welcome you to the 13th annual Matis David and Hina Stahl Memorial Lecture in Bioethics. And uh, first of all, I want to say that Dean Peter Amenta, uh, you know, who usually introduces these programs, again wants to welcome everyone, but he's not here today. He sends his apologies because he's away at a Council of Deans meeting. Uh, but he has provided me with some comments uh, to introduce you, welcome you to the program. Uh, so on behalf of UMD and J. Robert Wood Johnson Med School, uh, Dr. Mentor would like to thank Dr. Ted Stahl and Dr. Eva Stahl for their vision and commitment to the issue of bioethics. This important lecture encourages thought-provoking and meaningful dialogue among our students, faculty, staff, and the community. And I'd like to take a moment, particularly as a family physician, to discuss the importance of the family within the framework of this lecture and beyond. If you open your program, you'll see a very moving story about two remarkable individuals, Matis David and Hina Stahl. As you know, Ted Stahl has dedicated this lectureship in honor of his parents. And today, Dr. James Stahl and Mr. Douglas Stahl, Ted and Eva's sons, are carrying on in their parents' footsteps. So this is really a family affair today. The mishpacha, right? We're all here together. Dr. James Stahl, today's speaker, is an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School and senior scientist at Massachusetts General Hospital's Institute for Technology Assessment. And he'll be speaking on the very important topic of ethical issues in comparative and cost-effective health care. And we'll say some more about him and the, the topic a little bit later. His brother, Douglas Stahl, though, will introduce the program. And their sister, Lauren, is also in the audience again today. And Dina Mentor wrote that he felt compelled to acknowledge how honored Ted and Eva must be and how the, everyone there is a model for all of us to emulate each in our own way. So we're really honored to have everyone here, including the community. Uh, just a question, how many of you have been to programs before? Almost everybody here, right? Which speaks to, in fact, the interest in this subject and the fact that we're now 13 years going and going strongly. Um, on, what I wanted to say here also was to thank the Stahl Lecture Committee members, uh, as well as the individuals and organizations who've donated so generously to this program, as well as to Patty Hansen, Jennifer Forbes, Jeanette Evans, and the people in community relations for helping us to put this together, as well as our continuing education people here at the school. Through everyone's ongoing efforts, we're building a firm foundation of endowed lectureships, fellowships, and professorships for Robert Wood Johnson Medical School as it continues to grow and advance into the nation's top tier of publicly funded medical schools. At this time, I'm delighted to turn the program over to Douglas Stahl, who will take his father's place at the podium today to carry on this important tradition of creating an open and challenging dialogue for bioethical issues. Uh, uh, this lecture is sponsored by my parents in honor of my paternal grandparents, Matas David and Hina Stahl, Alham Shalom, who left Berlin for the United States in 1935-36 period when it was prudent to go. Society then was still stable, though showing unmistakable cracks. In an article I read today, Dr. Rudolfina Menzel, a noted pioneer in dog training and what she called canine psychology, similarly left Vienna for, for Israel in 1938. She said, even today it is difficult to understand how the Nazis managed to take control of the German people. Afterward, when the regime was consolidated, fear apparently prevented the nation's resistance. But how was it possible for educated intellectuals to fall victim to that mad furor? She says, only animal psychology can provide the answer. I had the privilege of knowing my grandfather, our opa, till I was 15. He was an intellectual, a graduate of the gymnasium, later a soldier in the First World War, then a POW of the Russians. He spoke eight languages. And prior to the gymnasium, he was a star at the yeshiva and my Oma was fully his equal and more in every important respect. He was very interested in moral philosophy by nature, experience, and training, and taught me a lot. He would say, Hu Haya Omer, anger should not be in your lexicon. Later I learned that the two deadly sins most emphasized in Jewish thought are anger and pridefulness, though self-esteem is also important, of course. This was his own particular paraphrase of similar statements by such as the Ranban. Once when I was about 10, I ran across something in my reading that astonished me. I went to him on his weekly visit and asked Opa, 
how do we know that anything at all exists, really? He looked at me wordlessly for a long moment with about that expression you see in that photograph, and then leaned over and very deliberately pinched me very hard on the thigh. He leaned back, looked at me carefully, and said, what do you think? <laughs> Later, I learned that this was his paraphrase, so to speak, of Samuel Johnson's rebuttal to Bishop Barclay. A valuable lesson, though I wonder whether I might have preferred that he'd simply quoted uh, Samuel Johnson. <laughs> he was a Torah scholar, and since this, and this week's Parsha Tazria is particularly apropos to this lecture. I'll cite a controversial author, Rabbi, Rabbi Matis Weinberg, in part because he's a namesake. Rabbi Weinberg cites Rabbi Dr. Ovadia Misiforno, a physician as well, who regards Tsaras as a genuine medical disease, a variety of cancer. But most Perushim understand, understand Tsaras, the famous skin disease, classically translated as leprosy, as a kind of spiritual ailment, which introduces the question, do people deserve their illnesses? Do they get what they deserve? People who suffer from Parkinsonism, people who suffer from smokers who suffer from heart disease or lung disease. Does society have to care for every type of sufferer? Saras is regarded as a punishment for Lashon Hara, for slander, tail-bearing sins of third-person speech. Even truth, if damaging, is Lashon Hara. Even listening to damaging statements about others is to commit this sin. I once asked Rabbi Raphael Lapin why it is that people don't get Saras today. Certainly Lashon Hara still, seems to still exist. Rabbi Lapin said that people then were closer to God, and thus these things manifested physically. Rabbi Weinberg says, quote, it is in the decay of systems that evil holds sway, not in their full-scale collapse. It is, in it, is subtlety, su it is subtlety then, it is in subtlety then that tuma, spiritual taint, lies in the noxious layer between the veneer of normalcy. And indeed, we fear open and wanton evil less than the hard to, det hard to detect infiltration of the pernicious. The sinister work done in secret by the slow proliferation of cancer cells eating away at bone or blood or lung or brain holds greater terrors for us than any knife. The processes that produce life produce tumor. The Baal Lashon Hara then operates secretly spreading slander as the Nazis did about the Jews. So if Tsaras is a spiritual ailment, why then is Mitzor quarantined, banished from the camp? In part, it's to prevent him from doing further harm. And in part, it is Mita Kenegad Mita. Rabbi Weinberg cites the Talmud in Arachim, says he used, he used Lashon Hara, damaging speech and, speech and language, to separate people from friends, so he too must be isolated. The other apropos point, element of the, of the Parsha is who declares the Mitzvah. Certainly they had Rofim, doctors in that era. And in this, in this lecture series, a basic topic is who gets care, who decides, and what constitutes care. Certainly, it seems better for the community that the Mitsura be exiled, but how is it from that human being's point of view? Is that care? Here's a specifically Jewish understanding of a particular condition, but to what extent could this example be broadened or ought to be? No doubt we'll have the answer in the forthcoming lecture. The Torah's answer in this particular case is, is that it's not the Rofe, the physician, who makes this ruling, but the Kohen, the hereditary priest, the same person who brings offerings to God on the altar in the temple and performs other spiritual functions. Perhaps there's some overlap with today's society since the yatros part of the name of some medical specialties is a Greek word that does mean priest. In that same living room that I asked, that, that I asked my opa that question, around that same time, I one day found my brother sitting quietly, cross-legged on the floor, facing the wall. I said to him, Jamie, what are you doing? He replied, if I can quote, I looked closer and I saw he was holding a fork. He was about five years old. And it stuck the back end of the fork into the wall socket. I put my hand on his shoulder. And then I began going. Then I pulled him away. So now we're about to hear from my brother who continues our grandfather's interest in ethics. And we'll find out whether I made the right decision. <laughs> Having had the privilege of having lunch today with the stalls and having a family get-together, I can tell you the dinner conversations are extremely interesting and all that, and they are both spiritually uplifting as well as very grounded in the realities of medical practice and the real world of our work. 
So uh, before I introduce uh, uh, Dr. Stoll, uh, James Stoll from Boston, just a brief co set of comments for the reason for our lecture today uh, on cost effectiveness, on ethical issues in comparative and cost effective healthcare. Uh, as you know, we couldn't have picked a more timely subject, and we did it on purpose because on March 23, 2010, President Obama, as we know, signed comprehensive health reform, the Patient Protective and Affordable Care Act, into law. And although we hear on the media all of the discussions about improving access and coverage and, you know, uh, dealing with issues of not being denied care if you have a pre-existing condition, within the legislation is a major piece, about $500 million, to support what's called comparative effectiveness research, which Dr. Stoll will define for us and talk further about. But they plan to establish a nonprofit patient-centered outcomes research institute to identify research priorities and conduct research that compares the clinical effectiveness of multiple treatments. As patients, as physicians, as consumers, if we go for care, do we get too much treatment, too many tests done, or do we not get enough? Are there death panels, as we hear, coming out? And of course there are not. How do we make decisions about mammography screening or prostate cancer screening? Is more care better care? Or in fact, should we be being more thoughtful about this as we bend the cost curve? So a lot of the issues that comparative effectiveness research get into relate to studies about drugs, devices, medical treatments, which works best for whom, how do we save money, but also be cautious about doing rationing of care? How do we find out if we're getting the value for the care that we receive? So that the topics that Dr. Stoll will be speaking about are oh so pertinent, not only to the efforts going on nationally, but to our own personal experiences as physicians, nurses, patients, healthcare administrators, hospitals, managed care plans, payers, because there are lots of major, major decisions that are going to be made and we all need to have discourse together in sorting this out. So your, your program provides a wonderful detailed biography uh, of Dr. James Stahl, and I'll just briefly uh, review that. He's an assistant professor of medicine at Harvard Medical School, senior scientist at the Mass General Hospital's Institute for Technology Assessment in Boston, Massachusetts. He's a board-certified internist and practicing clinician and one of our national leaders in patient-centered comparative effectiveness work. Uh, his research has focused on delivery, access, and organization of healthcare, innovation in healthcare, new and emerging technologies, modeling and simulation methods. He has background in public health and informatics, has looked at organ allocation policy, ethics and technology issues, and he's also collaborated very closely with one of our own faculty here, Dr. Frank Sonnenberg, uh, who's been one of our leaders in terms of much of our electronic health technology and editor of the Journal of Medical Decision Making as well. So there are probably many others in the, in the audience here who are also actively involved in this, but um, let me welcome Dr. James Stoll so we can learn more about your work and things. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and let me just open up the slides here. Still not used to Vista. So uh, anyway, thank you for inviting uh, inviting me. Uh, I certainly could not say no when my parents asked. That was certainly uh, something that uh, um, I'm very honored to do, and uh, also held great trepidation because it is my parents, and I, this, is, this is important. So I'm gonna talk about, uh, as uh, Dr. Light just mentioned, uh, some of the ethical issues in and surrounding comparative and cost-effective uh, healthcare. Um, now, this is a slide I, I have to confess I really struggled over, okay? Because uh, clearly, I don't have any financial conflict of interest, but clearly there are, are personal issues here. And as I look out in the audience, uh, as many people have joked to me already, this is a lot like my bar mitzvah except there are no checks involved. Um, so all the, all, the, all the cost, not much of the benefit. So uh, here we go. So why should I talk about this topic other than the fact that my parents asked me? Well, to start with, I am a, as a clinician, I regularly make real world decisions involving diagnostic and therapeutic technologies of varying uh, effectiveness and cost. 
And as a researcher, I, I deal regularly with these policy, the policy of implications of these choices. And how we deal with these issues is really central, as Dr. Lake mentioned, um, to how we understand and manage healthcare as we go forward, and particularly with the new le legislation that's just been passed. So what I'd like to do first, um, and for the, uh, for the beginning part of this talk, is first define terms. And I think this is very important, uh, particularly when we're going to start a national conversation. And we're going to talk about comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness. And then I'm going to survey some of the um, some of the issues, some of the ethical issues surrounding comparative and cost effectiveness. And these, though there are many others, the ones that after I surveyed many people who I, I know and respect, um, I think the ethics of, uh, of ignorance uh, and policy making and resource allocation are probably the three largest areas that people have ethical issues around this these domains. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some real-world responses to some comparative effectiveness, cost effectiveness type decisions, and this also will touch on some of my own research. So definitions. So why define terms? Well, so when words carry emotional weight and mean different things to different people, it is essential to define terms before you start talking about them. So otherwise, we just get into arguments where we're not really talking about the same thing, which is really not very productive. So what do ethics, comparative effectiveness, and cost effectiveness mean? Now, I actually, I like having people ask questions while I talk. So if somebody really has a burning question, please raise your hand. I will happily stop and we can talk about it. So ethics is um, about making decisions based on moral precepts in a real world context. And as you know, in the, in, with ethics, there's always a tension between what we, what we think we should do under ideal conditions and what we actually do when faced with the, a messy real, the messy real world. <clears throat> The core issues that we're going to talk about in, eth in this conversation, which will be a touchstone for the rest of this talk, uh, will be the core health uh, care ethical issues of anatomy, beneficence, and non-malevolence, and justice. I'll probably say do no harm for non-malevolence just because non-malevolence is a mouthful. Um, so all these uh, principles really derive from the golden rule, and I think I want to point out right off of the bat that the, go the, ru the golden rule, and you know, do not do unto others, and these principles uh, intrinsically manifest a tension between the individual and society. So what's in a decision? Because ethics is about making decisions. So every decision, in every decision, you basically have to make a choice between two or more strategies. You've got to decide what you're going to do, you choose between. And these strategies involve um, a path, which, uh, which is you made a choice, I'm going to pursue some, some objective, and it involves knowledge, resources, what are the probabilities that these things are going to actually come, come to pass, and then there has to be an outcome. You can't have a decision without actually having some sort of outcome in it, because otherwise you're not making a choice, you're just, it's just theoretical. So in making a decision, you need to consider both, both the path and how, and how you value the outcome are very important in, in how we value the choice. And medical ethic applies to both the path and the outcome. So how should we compare strategies? So, okay, well now we know what a decision is. We have a bit, a bit of an idea of ethics. Now, we've all talked about comparative and cost effectiveness. So how should, we, how should we compare these strategies? Should we do it by cost alone, effect alone, or cost and effect together? So let's, let's pose the, the experiment. You have a cost alone. So you have to choose between two therapies to treat an infection. You have alpha costly quinolone, and beta not so much as all, okay? <laughs> and you know that they're prices, and drug A costs more than drug B. So which do you choose? Well, in a cost alone world, we would choose the least expensive therapy, the beta not so much as all. And so some, what are the ethical implications of this? So in a cost alone world, you know, all these clinical and policy decisions are based on the buyer's perspective. And they don't really consider questions of beneficence, non-malevolence, and justice. And if you may ask yourself, does this really happen now? And the answer is yes. So who makes decisions based on cost alone? Well, I would say probably every clinician in this room, and uh, many of the people who are not clinicians, probably know somebody who on a, uh, some month has had to decide what pills they're going to take. Are they going to take their hypertensive medicines or their, or their lipid medicines? Because they couldn't afford it. And they're making that choice based on cost alone. Now, for patients, this is usually an uninformed decision. Now, with insurance companies, now you, some people might argue with me about this, but you can, you can, they also can make uh, decisions based on cost alone. You might think about tiered medicines that uh, for basically me too drugs. So why, you know, what is the difference between 
uh, Zyrtec and, um, and uh, loratadine, you know, in terms of effectiveness. Not really not much, but there is a difference in cost. So there are choices based, that are driven based on cost alone. So what do we do if in an effect alone world? What are the implications of that? So you have to choose between therapies for heart failure and arrhythmia. So you have, let's say, the Starker 9000 or the Bissell effect uh, 2B. So you know, their, you know their effect, let's say in life years. So ICD, that's an in, implantable con, uh, uh, cardio defibrillator, for those of you who are not clinicians. And ICDA yields more life years than ICDB. So which do you choose? Well, based on effect alone, you know, the rational person will choose the most effective, the, the Starker 9000. So what are their ethics and, and, and the implications of, of an effect alone world? So effect alone assumes that there's no cost to you or anyone else. So that, so that assumes that only the beneficiary's perspective counts and does not consider a whole bunch of things in terms of implicit trade-offs, opportunity costs, and I would say most importantly consequences of choices on others. Now, it's not all bad. I mean, I would say that effective loan definitely takes the perspective of beneficence in, in terms of uh, if you're a clinician, you are trying to find the best effective care for whoever's in front of you. Now, the negatives are that it potentially can create uh, conflicts with do no harm and justice. Uh, because in this perspective, these choosing you know, based on these strategies on effective loan doesn't really consider that if the resources that you chose to, to expend might have been spent on more people or maybe to a greater benefit to society as a whole which, you know, I like, this is one of my favorite quotes, you know, from Hillel is, you know, if I am only for myself, what am I? So again, we're going back to this question of between the individual and society. Should we really be basing our choices based on, you know, how should we be grounding our choices? And I would say that it has to include both. So using, basing decisions on cost or effect alone tends to ignore consequences to others. And that's context in that ethical statement that I led off with. And they have the potential, potential to violate one or more of these core medical um, ethical principles, such as do no harm or justice. So I have to ask the question, so if ethics is about making moral decisions while taking into account difficulties raised by local context, i.e. the effects of your decisions and others, then if we make decisions without considering context, that well, that may be unethical, and it is potentially even aethical. So I would... Uh, I would come out a bit stronger, as you'll see, than whether or not we should be comparative effectiveness um, or whether or not we should be doing cost effectiveness. So what are these things that, that everybody's so um, up emotional about in terms of comparative effectiveness and cost effectiveness? Um, so comparative effectiveness, I should have warned you, there's a little math here. We are subtracting. Um, so comparative effectiveness, which is the, uh, the top line here, let's see if you can um, you take the effect of A minus the effect of B, and that's your comparative effectiveness, all right? That's the difference between effect. This is opposed to the standard um, model of comparing effect to placebo. So in this case, the effect of A is minus nothing, okay? So you're just looking at it's, that its effect. Now, this tends to make um, comparative effectiveness usually a, a better choice in terms of when you're trying to understand policy. But don't get me wrong. I don't think, you know, placebo-controlled trials are bad. I just don't think they're necessarily the best thing for policymaking. I think uh, placebo-controlled trials are essential for understanding things like causality. So did the thing actually make a difference? Now, that's a different question, even though we tend to use these placebo trials, or the drug companies and many other companies want us to use these um, for, our, um, for making policy decisions. Um, but in effect, when I compare, let's say, one lipid-lowering agent to placebo, versus one lipid lower agent to another lipid lower agent, it has a very different consequence. So that is the, that's the difference between comparing to a placebo versus comparative effectiveness. Now, and now here is even more difficult. Now we're actually dividing. Not only are we subtracting, we are now dividing. So this is cost effectiveness. So cost effectiveness is that comparative effectiveness on the bottom line. So you're taking the cost of A minus the cost of B, and the effect of A over the effect of A minus the effect of B, okay? So this is, comp this is cost effectiveness analysis in a nutshell, okay? So CEA, which I'll refer, this is how I refer to it, comp captures these comparisons between two different strategies or two different therapies or two different di diagnostic um, um, instruments 
um, in a single ratio commonly referred to as the ICER, which is the, for those of you who aren't familiar, called the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So this ratio compares the incremental, marginal, comparative cost per unit of health gain from an intervention for the same condition without monetizing the effect. So we're not really turning this into money, okay? Now, there are different methods of analysis that will try to convert everything into a single unit. We're not doing that here. That's not cost effectiveness. So we are using, well, you know, basically this says how much bang for the buck do we get? That is cost effectiveness. So now it raises a couple issues. Now, so the apples and oranges issues. So what do you do, how do you do, choose between therapies that do different things? So for example, you have a healthcare budget. You're in charge. This is all about decision making, by the way, just like ethics. You have a healthcare budget and you have to choose between spending your money on vaccines or ICDs or let's say blood pressure medicine or dental care, or organ transplants or colon cancer screening. How do you make a choice between those? They, they seem to do very different things. You know, dollars are dollars, but how do you compare the outcomes of these different things fairly? Well, a common outcome in most of this is essentially time, or lifetime, and specifically. So how much extra life does a treatment yield? So all these outcomes that affect Dollars are dollars, but the effect that we translate all these things into is how many life years do you get? So this is also commonly, you know, when you read, if you pick up an article and you see these terms, this is what it means. It's time. So time is a life expectancy. How many years do you gain from a, from a therapy? Or life years or life months or life days or life minutes. It can get actually quite small. Of course, it raises a question here. So does a year of perfect health let's say, equal a year on dialysis. That's a bit of a stick, a sticky point, right? So if I'm spending money for a year of life, is that year of life the same? Nobody's nodding heads. I usually get, you know, you know people asking questions at this point. So I would say, so what, what the, this field has developed over time is basically the quali quality adjusting a life here. So they're basically, if you answer the question, no, that a year of perfect health is not the same thing as a year of life on dialysis, then you're saying that there's a different quality there, right? And how do you capture that qu difference in quality? So, um, and this is where this term quality of life year or quality of life expectancy comes in. Now, quality of life is usually weighted from zero, to, uh, which is equal to death, versus one, which is perfect health, okay? So for example, I might have a life year and I adjust it by one point 0.8 qualities, so that's 0.8 quality of life unit, units, and so that's a 0.8 quality. Now, most of these estimates of quality of life with, in a certain health state, that's another term you're going to hear a lot of, the health state of being on dialysis, the health state of, of having hypertension, all these sort of things, um, are usually based on surveys of people like you. I say, so what do you think? How good is a year of life in this condition? And the people get that data, and people just like you and they collect it. And there, and there are way, different ways that we ask these questions, and we can talk about that after if we, if we have time. So what that does is it allows, not only does the time help us, uh, allow us to compare uh, interventions, but allows us to you know, start comparing across interventions by, by putting the